Good afternoon, everyone. Please allow, allow me to take a drink here. I've worked feverishly to get this going. I was having some problems with the software, you know, technology. But I'm glad you're with us today. My name is uh, Carlos Reyes. I am the pastor of the North Star Church. And I just want to encourage you today to get your Bibles so that you can join me and uh, we can go through the Word of God. I've been doing a series on training. And over the last few weeks, I've been talking about different aspects of our training. And um, if you have not uh, seen any of those, please do make yourself uh, available to those, or should I say those are available to you on our Facebook page. And take a look at them, listen to them, take notes. It's really, I think, important for you to understand that we as believers, as Christians, as born-again uh, folk, that we need to train because the hour is here for the church to arise. And I want to encourage you as a pastor to do that. So without further ado, what I'd like to do is pray, and then we'll get into the Word of God. So let's bow our heads. Father, in the name of Jesus, we come before you with thanksgiving. We thank you, Lord, that you sent, Father, that you sent your son Jesus to die on a cross. And not only did he die, he was buried, and on the third day he rose again. And now he sits at your right hand. Jesus, we love you. Jesus, we thank you for what you've done for us. And today we pray that you, by your Holy Spirit, would help us to see what we need to see. Lord, that there are people here that are listening to this recording that need to grasp what you want for them. Lord, what you want them to do, not for their glory, but for your glory. And I pray this in the wonderful name that is a name above every other name, the name of Jesus Christ. And we said, Amen. So everybody in this world has faith. Uh, just have a conversation with a scientist, with a biologist, and you'll begin to understand that faith is a necessary thing to do anything. Any endeavor that you want to be part of, you have to have faith. Now, for a non-believer, a non-Christian, they may not call it faith. As a matter of fact, scientists may call it a theory. But this theory is something that they hold dear and they strive after to find the answer. Now, for us as Christians, those that have accepted the Lord Jesus Christ, we have to have the faith that God requires. I want you to open up your Bibles to Hebrews chapter 11. We're going to go there and we're really just going to read one verse but I want you to, if you have a highlighter, underline. If you have a pen or pencil, uh, should I say underline it. If you have a highlighter, make sure you highlight this verse. And the verse is found in uh, Hebrews 11. And if I can uh, get this unstuck here, there we go. Hebrews 11. And let's read it. And uh, you can let me read it and you just go along with it and let it be something that internalizes in your spirit, in yourself. The Bible says, And without faith it is impossible to please him, that is God, for whoever would draw near to God must believe that he exists and that he rewards those who seek him. So we see there's no ambiguity ambiguity there. Sorry, I can't speak today. There must be faith. See, faith is an important ingredient, and as I said, everyone has faith. The difference between Christians and non-Christians is not the fact of faith. That really isn't it. But listen, it's the object of faith. It's not faith in itself, but the object of faith. See, the non-Christian, 
the unsaved person, they trust in themselves and they trust in other human beings. That's the object of faith. But for us as Christians, we must trust God. As I said, Hebrews eleven six. 6, let me read it to you from the New Living Translation. Anyone who wants to come to him, God, must believe that God exists and that he rewards those who, listen to this, sincerely seek him. As Christians, we have to be sincere in our faith. We have to love God. We truly have to love God, that he is not just uh, someone that we go to as a get out of jail card type of thing, that we truly have a relationship with God. See, it is the Christian's faith that is the secret to victory and to the service unto God. That's the key, our faith. If you have any doubts that God honors faith, I would encourage you to read that whole chapter that we just pulled that one scripture out of, Hebrews, the letter to the Hebrews, chapter 11. Read that whole thing, and you will see something that is an amazing read. The uh, writer talks about these different peoples that by faith they believed in something, so they acted on it without seeing that thing. And some of them never got to see it, but they believed by faith that what they were doing was what God wanted. See, as a pastor of over 30 years, I've come to realize that one of the greatest hindrances to maturity, one of the problems that God has with those of us that call ourselves born again, believers, followers of Jesus, disciples of Jesus, what we have a problem with is the ability to develop our faith. Last week, I talked about Satan. I talked about the devil. And I have to tell you that uh, he knows that we have this problem in the church. And so, therefore, what he does, he attacks the believer's faith. He does it in a very subtle, a very kind of like he did with the woman in the Garden of Eden. He poses questions. He gives you a different perspective. But Paul's word to the young Christians in Thessalonica, the church in Thessalonica, illustrates this point. Look at what he said. Let's go there. First Thessalonians. First Thessalonians. And we're going to go to chapter 3. First Thessalonians. And we're going to jump around in that uh, chapter a little bit. 1 Thessalonians chapter 3, and we're going to read verses 1 and 2, 5 through 7, 5, 6, 7, and 10. Let's read it, 1 and 2. Therefore, when we could bear it no longer, we were willing to be left behind at Athens alone. And we sent Timothy, our brother and God's co-worker, in the gospel of Christ to establish and exhort you in your faith. Let's drop down to verse 5. For this reason, when I could bear it no longer, I sent to learn about your faith for fear that somehow the tempter, who is Satan, had tempted you and our labor would be in vain. But now that Timothy has come to us from you and has brought us the good news of your faith and love and reported that you always remember us kindly and long to see us as we long to see you. Verse 7, for this reason, brothers, in all our distress and affliction, we have been comforted about you through your, what? Faith. Paul continued to talk about faith to these young Christians. Paul was giving them a principle, 
a theological uh, a theological point that faith is the most important thing that a believer must have and must develop. See, according to Romans chapter 1, verse 17, the Christian is supposed to go from faith to faith. That's what a Christian's life should be, from faith to faith. It's not a one-time thing. When we accept the Lord Jesus Christ, we come to him by faith, but then we live our lives faith to faith. All you have to do is read the story of Abraham in Genesis chapter 12 through chapter 25, and you're going to see that all that God did, he did in order to perfect Abraham's faith. It is a spiritual principle. Look at what Jesus said in Matthew 9, 29. According to your faith, be it done to you. That's what Jesus said. Whenever God works in and through your life, it's always in response to faith. He wants to build you up. He wants to strengthen you. See, the thing that hinders the work of God is not his lack of power, but his people's lack of faith. We're training We're getting ready for what God is about to do. And faith should be at the top of the list of how we grow and mature. The Bible says in Matthew 13, 58, And he did not do many mighty works there because of their what? Not faith. Unbelief. That's the opposite. God through his son Jesus Christ, could not do many things because of their unbelief. Another translation says, and he was amazed at their unbelief. My brothers and sisters, we have to understand that if God is going to move in the church, it begins in this temple. It begins in here. We have to grow our faith. We have to go from being a baby to growing up. And this raises a very important question. How can the believer know that he is living in faith? And I'm going to pause and uh, say that I'm drawing these uh, thoughts um, and adapting them to this message from a man of God by the name of, I believe it's Warren Wearsby. And so I just wanted to give him a shout out. He wrote a book and uh, he had some of these thoughts in there. So I just wanted to make sure that I said that. Um, But to be honest, all I did was take some of his words and now I am using my words to expand, to exhort, and to challenge you today to do something. See, it's so easy for us to be fooled by our own feelings. How many of you have been fooled by your feelings? How many of you have been overwhelmed by how you feel? And you say something to the effect, but it seemed right to do it in the moment. Have you ever done that? See, or or by the circumstances around us, by things that are going on, or as I said, by Satan himself and his demonic powers. The Bible says in Ephesians 6, 12, listen, for we do not wrestle against flesh and blood, but against principalities, against powers, against the rulers of the darkness of this age, against spiritual hosts of wickedness in the heavenly places. See, we don't wrestle against people. It's always a spiritual thing. And so I, again, want to encourage you to begin to exercise, to build your faith. See, there are tests or questions that you can put to all the decisions, all the actions that you are doing or thinking about or about to do. 
And these questions are very practical. So I'm going to go through some of them. And uh, you can write them down. Please do write them down. The first one, the first question is, am I doing this for the glory of God or just to please myself? Let me repeat it. Am I doing this for the glory of God or just to please myself? And it's an unfortunate thing in the culture that we live today. It's all about me. It's all about what I want. It's all about me being in a place that I want to be. And so when you become a Christian, a born-again believer, someone who is saved by the blood of Jesus Christ, you have to begin to be transformed. The Bible says, let us not conform to this world, but be transformed by the renewing of our what? Our mind so that we can then know God's good and perfect will for our lives. And so we have to train. I keep saying that, but it's important. We have to train. So listen to what Paul said about the faith of Abraham. No unbelief made him waver concerning the promise of God, but he grew, grew strong in his faith as he gave glory to God. That's Romans chapter 4, verse 20. No unbelief made him waver concerning the promise of God. And if you don't know the story of Abraham, I'm going to tell you a little bit about it, but you should read this story. It's an incredible story. And in the New Living Translation, that same verse reads like this, Abraham never wavered in believing God's promise. In fact, his faith grew stronger, and in this, he brought glory to God. So that's the other principle I want to tell you. When you grow stronger in your faith, that in itself will bring glory to God. See, Abraham and Sarah, his wife, they were both past the age of having children. And yet, God promised Abraham and Sarah that they were going to have a son in their old age. F.B. Meyer said this, You never really trust God until you trust him to do the impossible. And that's exactly true in my life, and it should be in your life. There are things that God will do if you have the faith and it's going to seem like an impossibility. It's going to seem like it can't happen. But I'm here to tell you I'm living proof, along with my wife and children, that God, in fact, does the impossible. See, I can tell you story after story how God did the impossible in my life. But unfortunately, time will not permit it. But I will say this, that God has proven himself faithful time and time again. And in each season of my life, God has done things because I believed in him. I trusted in him. As a matter of fact, let's go to Proverbs chapter 3. It's a, a great, great uh, couple of verses that uh, I must say are my wife's favorite. If I can get there myself. Give me a second. Here we go. Proverbs chapter 3. Proverbs chapter 3. And um, the whole chapter is good. But let's read two verses. These are my wife's favorite ones. Verse 5. Trust in the Lord with all your heart and do not lean on your own understanding. In all your ways, acknowledge him and he will make straight your past. May the Lord add a blessing to the reading of this word. You are out there. I may not even know what's going on in your life, but I can tell you that God wants you to trust him and stop leaning on your own understanding. It was not Abraham's faith in faith that wrought that miracle of the son who was called Isaac, the promised son. It was his faith in God. And in his story, God does 
have them get to a place where they have their son. Abraham knows his wife, and in the Bible, when you say no, that means he had sex with her at an old age, and she became pregnant, and she had Isaac. And then years later, God required Abraham to sacrifice his son. And in those days, in the pagan uh, religions, they would do that. They would sacrifice their children. And so when Abraham was told this by God in his relationship with God, Abraham said he must do it. And the story is turned around. God does an amazing thing. And I want you to go there and read the story for yourself if you don't know this story. For those of you that do know the story, I will say you know what I'm talking about. There are times that God will ask you to do something that seems crazy, that seems not quite what you were thinking of doing. And I'm here to tell you that God is not only growing your faith, he wants to see you move into a place of the supernatural where God can use you in his service more and more. And so the world's shallow philosophy, I've been talking about philosophy for the last four Sundays, and the world's shallow philosophy is this, have faith, everything will work out. You know, that's in a, it's a foolish as it is ineffective. Faith in what? Abraham and Sarah trusted God, and God did what he promised because Abraham knew God. He said this in Romans 4, 21. He was fully convinced that God is able to do whatever he promises. Again, it's important, though, to notice that Abraham's motive in all of this was to give God all of the glory. Faith always gives God the glory. For faith confesses that man is unable to accomplish anything that only God can do. Luke 1, verse 37 says, For nothing will be impossible with God. That's when Gabriel was talking to Mary, and Mary said, I don't know a man. And Gabriel said, No, 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 the Holy Ghost, the Holy Spirit is going to overwhelm you, is going to cover you, and you're going to be with child. And then he said, for nothing will be impossible with God. And then in Matthew 19, 26, it says, Jesus looked at them and said, with man, this is impossible. But with God, all things are possible. Come on, say it. With God, all things are possible. I need you to say it again. But with God, all things are possible. I want you to believe this. I want you to know this. So whenever you are about to make a decision or take a step in your Christian walk or even in your ministry, ask yourself, am I doing this for God's glory alone? See, if there's any indication in your heart that self-glory, that's how uh, 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 Warren put it, Self-glory is involved. Stop immediately and wait on the Lord for his direction. True faith is motivated only by desiring to glorify God. So that's question number one. Question number two, am I rushing ahead as an impulse? Um, yes, like an impulse. Am I rushing ahead as an impulsive act. Let's say that. I was going to give you another word, but I was trying to change that word. Am I rushing ahead as an impulsive act, or am I willing to wait? Let's put it that way. The Scripture says this. Uh, let me, Romans 10, 11. For the scripture says, everyone who believes in him will not be put to shame, will not be disappointed. See, the Christian who waits for God's leading and waits on God's working will not be put to shame, or as one translation puts it, will not be disappointed, as I mentioned. True faith is not in a hurry. 
If you happen to be a person that's always rushing to do something, this is going to be a difficult one. See, the Christian, he waits until God opens the door, opens the way. I've been a pastor a long time, and people, well-meaning people, tell me this, tell me that, encourages me to do this, the church to do that. But I'm here to tell you that I receive those with love. But who I really want to hear from is God Almighty. Now, he does speak through people, but you have to grow that faith muscle so that you can understand when it's a person talking or God speaking through that person. See, you are sure sometimes if you're not careful to act in fleshly unbelief. And instead of true spiritual faith, you're just going by what you feel, by what you think. The Bible says in Romans 14, 23, for whatever is not from faith is sin. Boy, I've had to repent so many times when I've done something impetuously, you know, like I've just rushed into it. And then I find out it's not God, it's just me wanting what me wants or when, what someone else wants. Sometimes parents do that. They rush in to do something for their child and they find out later down the road that they should not have done that. That in fact, God wanted them to do the other thing, whatever that was. And so as parents, we also have to believe that we're, what, setting an example. So we don't act out impetuously. We don't do that. We don't act rashly. We wait on the Lord, and we know that the Lord is going to open the door. Let's go to the next test. The next test is, can I defend what I'm doing or question? Can I defend what I am doing from the Word of God? Let me repeat that. Can I defend what I am doing from the Word of God? See, true faith is always grounded in the Word of God, the Bible. The Bible says in Romans 10, 17, So then faith comes by hearing and hearing by the Word of God. And that's what I attempt to do each and every Sunday at our church, is to bring the Word of God so that people can hear the voice of God and then they can act on his voice because he can speak multiple ways in one message to everyone if they have ears to hear and have a heart prepared to receive the word of God. See, no matter how reasonable an action seems, if it contradicts the word of God, you cannot do it by faith. It's impossible to do it by faith. See, the Bible gives us precepts to obey, it gives us promises to claim and principles to follow. See, but if we violate any of those things, obedience, promises to claim, principles to follow, if we violate any of these, we are acting in unbelief and not in faith, and so therefore that is sin. That's what I just said earlier. So we have to work out. We have to train our faith muscle. Let me put it that way. That's why Jesus was able to say, what? All you need is but this much of faith, like a mustard seed. And you see that mountain? You'll be able to move it. And God was talking at that time, and people were going, what is he talking about? I'm here to tell you that if you grow in faith, that if you train and get that muscle of faith working, you are going to see some incredible things in your life and in the life of your family, in the life of those people around you. I want to encourage you. You need to understand that you need to grow in faith. See, people, as I said, may encourage you. Circumstances may seem to favor us. You know that Jonah and uh, his story found a ship waiting for him. But if you know the story, that was not what God wanted him to do. But he thought that God had placed that, that, that ship there. 
And that wasn't the first thing that God wanted to do. And, and let, me, let me just say this. Um, God has his good and perfect will for you. But if you act impetuously, you act out of selfishness, God will continue to work with you, but there will be uh, consequences that you will experience so that God can get you back on track. So God doesn't give up on you. Please don't feel hopeless. God doesn't give up on you. But he does want you to mature. And doing that means your faith has to grow. See, if we are disobeying the word of God, again, we are not acting in faith. This means that God cannot bless us. He cannot bless us or use us to bring glory to his name when we are doing things that are not faithful to his word. Hmm. Let me give you the, the last one I'm going to give you today, the last question, the last test. As I contemplate this move, this action, do I have joy and peace in my life? Do I have joy and peace within? That's a great question. Romans 15, 13, it says this. Now, may the God of hope fill you with all joy and peace in believing that you may abound in hope by the power of the Holy Spirit. You know, a relationship with the Holy Spirit is so important. You know, I would say to you that if you only have relationships with God the Father and God the Son, and you do not have a relationship with God the Holy Spirit, your faith walk is going to be stagnant. It's not going to grow. You have to have a relationship with the Holy Spirit. See, where there is true faith, the Holy Spirit is at work. And where the Spirit as, is at work, he will produce the fruit of hope, joy, and peace. Woo! Yes, sir. Hmm. See, having the peace of God in your heart is one piece of evidence that you, listen, that you are in the will of God. Having the peace of God. You know, in Philippians, it talks about what we're to think on, what we are to meditate, what we are not to do. We are not to be anxious. We are not to worry. And Paul says to the Philippians, and the peace that surpasses all understanding will be yours. Do you want that kind of peace in your life? See, I have that kind of peace. It has nothing to do with Carlos. It has nothing to do with B. It has nothing to do with my sons, my granddaughters. It has everything to do with God Almighty. I believe him. You know, right now there's this whole thing. I believe her. <laughs> I believe him, God Almighty. Who do you believe? Who do you trust? See, Again, let me repeat myself. Where there is true faith, the Holy Spirit, the Holy Ghost is at work. The peace of Christ is supposed to, this is what the Bible says, rule in your hearts. That's Colossians chapter 3, verse 15. And the word rule in that verse literally means to be the umpire. Yes, sir umpire calling balls and strikes in your life see when you lose god's peace within you you know that you have somewhere detoured from the will of god where do you find yourself today are you somewhere where you're not supposed to be excuse me god is good he is going to get you back you needed to listen to this message god wants to help you today he wants you to get back on that path, that path of faith. See, it is in this area that Christians have to learn to distinguish between human emotions and the deeper work of God in their lives. God never denies our emotions, please. He gave us emotions. 
he certainly can use them to accomplish his purpose. But often, as we step out by faith, we experience human fears and anxieties. But if we are walking by faith, those fears will eventually be overcome by a deeper sense, a deeper joy, a deeper peace. And all of a sudden, that which you were afraid of is just a vapor. It's just smoke. Though I walk through the valley of death, I will fear no evil. That's what Psalm 23 says, right? We have to begin, my brothers and my sisters, to walk by faith. See, this, what I'm talking about, is the work of the Holy Spirit. It's the work of the Spirit of God in response to our faith in God's Word. So I'm going to give you some homework. I want you to read Genesis chapter 16, and I want you to apply these questions and see the answers and find the answers in that story. Genesis chapter 16. And then I want you to go over to the New Testament in the book of Acts, Acts 27. And I want you to apply these questions. See, I want you to begin this because eventually, not eventually, <laughs> Soon and very soon. I want you to do that on your own life. Begin to question, did I do this for the glory of God or was it for self-glory? Right? Those are the questions. Let me, let's go through the questions very quickly, shall we? I wasn't going to do this, but um, let's do it. First test, am I going to do this for the glory of God or just please myself? How about the second one? The second one is, am I rushing ahead impetuously? In other words, rushing rashly ahead as an impulsive act. Or am I willing to wait? For those of you that are quick to talk, quick to act, I tell you to slow your roll, slow down. Maybe God doesn't want to, you to talk Quickly, Maybe you may get into a conversation where you just have to be quiet and wait on the Lord to give you something to say instead of just talking for the sake of talking. See, marriages do that, and I'm here to tell you, sometimes it's better just to shh and wait on the Lord. How about test number or question number three? Can I defend what I am doing from the Word of God? Well, that indicates that you have to know the Word of God. And so that's another thing that has to happen in your building up and becoming mature. You need to know the Word of God. And you need to know the Word of God correctly, not kind of like from your perspective. It's from God's perspective. This Sunday I'm going to be talking on a subject matter that it's going to be hard on people, but I'm going to bring it from God's perspective, and I hope that you hear my heart, but more importantly that you hear the heart of God. And so, the, again, the question is, can I defend what I am doing from the Word of God? And then lastly, as I contemplate this move, do I have joy and peace? Those are the four things that you have to do. Um, when we apply these questions to our walk of faith, we have to be careful to understand that God has given us defenses, so that we can use. And so one of the best ones is the Word of God. I'm going to encourage you to read, to study, to make a journal, write it out. Because once you internalize the Word of God, let me tell you, there's a couple of things that happen. Now you will know what God wants you to do by faith. And you will be able to hear Satan himself and say, no. That's not true. You'll be like Jesus when he was in the wilderness and you just kick scripture back to that devious, devious devil. If you don't do this, Satan will weaken and discourage your faith and he will tempt you to stop trusting God. The devil is a liar. 
See, if we seek the glory of God, if we patiently wait on God, if we follow the word of God, and if we enjoy the peace and joy of God through his Holy Spirit, then we can be sure that we are living by faith and not by sight. We are living by faith and we are defeating the enemy. We are living by faith and we are seeing the blessing of God to begin to come into our lives and the blessing be able to be overflowing and then touch our children, touch our spouse, touch our family members. I'm here to encourage you today. Build up your faith. Build up your faith. Believe in God. You have been believing in the philosophy of the world for too long, and it has gotten you nowhere. It may have gotten you even into deeper debt. I'm here to tell you, stop. Begin to understand that there is no philosophy other than the knowledge of Jesus Christ. So first, if you're out there and you don't know Jesus, I've been talking about a believer. I've been talking about someone that's born again. I've been talking about someone that's saved. I am talking about someone who's accepted Jesus Christ. And maybe you've gone to church. Maybe you've gone to a nice place where you, could go, you can go. You like the people. You enjoy the message. You enjoy the music. And you have never prayed the prayer I'm about to pray, which is basically called the sinner's prayer. See, you have to confess with your tongue and believe by faith in your heart that Jesus Christ came, crucified, died, buried, resurrected, and now he's at the right hand of the Father. You actually have to confess that with your mouth, out loud, publicly. I'm not going to manipulate you into doing it, but I'm going to pray this prayer. And if you are there, if you're sensing God right now, you're sensing his Holy Spirit, just, just touching your heart and saying, now is the time. I want you to repeat after me, would you? Father, today, I admit that I am a sinner. I'm walking my own way. But today, I believe by faith, that you sent your son, Jesus, to die on a cross for me. And he did die on that cross for my sins. He was buried, and then on the third day, he rose again. And he now sits at your right hand, Father. So today, because I believe that, I choose Jesus as my Savior. Jesus, come into my life. Come into my heart. Help me. I need you, Jesus. I pray that you would come, Holy Spirit, and begin the work that is needed in my life so that I can then become like Jesus. Father, I've come home. Thank you so much for giving me a way back into your kingdom. I pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. If you prayed this for the very first time today, man, there are is a party going on with the angels up in heaven. They are celebrating that you accepted the Lord Jesus Christ. As a matter of fact, this past Sunday, uh, there was a young man by the name of Gabriel, a little guy, and he called his grandmother, he called his aunt, his uncle, to tell them, his grandfather, to tell them that he had accepted Jesus Christ. And we're just hooting and hollering, just letting him know that there was a party going on. And so if you've accepted the Lord Jesus Christ today, I want you to send me an email at pc at my North Star, North Star Church. And just let me know that you have prayed that prayer with me because I would love to send you some resources. And I, I'd like to make sure you understand what are some of the things, the next steps that you need to, to take. So again, 
welcome into the kingdom if you've prayed that prayer and send me a little email. It doesn't have to be long. You can make it long, but it does not have to be long. At PC, the letter P as in Paul, the letter C as in Carlos, my name, Pastor Carlos, but just PC, at my North Star Church. All one word, my North Star Church. Dot com. Thank you so much. Uh, if you have uh, prayed that prayer and you're willing to send me an email. Now, I'm going to pray for the rest of you. That's right. You guys that are believers, now you are as well, by the way, saved, born again. I'm going to pray a prayer over you, a prayer of faith, believing that God's going to do something in your life. Father, in the name of Jesus Christ, I first thank you for this platform, for this opportunity, Lord, so that I can, Father, come humbly before you and you use me as an oracle, as someone that can speak from your word to your people. And today, Father, you're speaking faith. Lord, there are things that need to happen in each of our lives that sometimes we allow our emotions to get in the way. We allow our mind that is sometimes taken over by the philosophy of the world to uh, take control, and then we don't do what you want. Father, Lord, first I pray, Father, that they would repent, that they would ask for forgiveness, that they would ask you, Father, to give them the instructions, the marching orders that they need. There are some that, Lord, in this season, this coming season, they're going to find employment in different places. Lord, that they are going to go to places that maybe they've had a desire for, but now you're going to open that door. But there is going to be, Lord, uh, a decrease possibly in salary. But by faith, you open that door. I believe they need to walk through that door. There are some that are going to, Lord, be able to speak the gospel to their family. Lord, they've been afraid. Father, they have been uh, anxious. But today, Father, I pray for the boldness of the Holy Spirit, the boldness of the Holy Ghost, so that they would, Father, open their mouths in love and begin to speak the gospel of Jesus Christ. And then there are others, Lord, that they have had difficulties, Father, in relationships. They have had difficulties, Lord, maybe with their spouse, maybe with a sibling, Father, maybe with their parent. Today, I pray, Father, that you would, Lord, begin, Lord, that reconciliation that needs to happen. For they are going to walk by faith and believe that their relationship with, with whomever it is is going to begin to become right. And then there are others, Lord, that have friends, that have neighbors, that have people that have no business being in their lives, and they know it, but they refuse to let them go. Lord, Father, today I pray again for that boldness of the Holy Spirit, and Lord, pray that they understand that it's not until they let these people go, well-meaning as they are, Father, they need to be let go because they are not people of faith. Lord, and in the name of Jesus, Father, you're going to replace those people with other people. So, Lord, I pray for that person, that they would truly, Father, begin. Father, that, 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 that job, that uh, task of taking out so you can replace. I pray this, Father, in the wonderful name of Jesus Christ. And everyone said, Amen. Hey, thank you again for being with us. Sorry about starting off late. A lot of technical things on my end, and I'm not too technically savvy, so to speak, but I got it going. You were able to hear it. I would encourage you to uh, send this video to people you feel would be blessed by this message of faith. And I encourage you to be with us on Sundays at 11 a.m. Now, number one, we are having services outside, and we are still having them outside. It's still not cold so that you can come and just join us if you are desirous to being out among people. I understand if you are not. And so we'll still have the live stream. You'll still be able to see it from your home and the comfort of your home, so to speak. 
So whether you are coming out or staying, we do it every Sunday at 11 on our YouTube channel. We also have a YouTube channel. And uh, all you have to do for the very first time is come to our Facebook page and they will tell you how to get over to our YouTube page. And one last thing, you have to reserve a spot. We want to know how many people we're going to have because we have been abiding by the guidelines of our officials here in Montgomery County. So we want enough space so that people can come and safely uh, enjoy the fellowship of other believers. And so I encourage you to, there's a Genius app, uh, our link, I should say, on our Facebook page that you hit on it. And you tell us how many people are coming in your group. And um, we'll then send you the address to where we meet outside. It's going to be a great Sunday this coming uh, week. So I hope that you can join us either live at our outdoor service or on our live stream. But in any event, again, thank you so much. Now, I'm going to put this video over on our YouTube channel as well. I really want you to think of people that might be blessed by this um, message, not for, again, me, but for the glory of God. That's what we're all about. So thank you. And uh, I believe tomorrow on our Facebook page, I know, as a matter of fact, there's going to be a devotion with some worship at 9 o'clock with uh, one of our dear people from our worship team. Uh, Sophia. And so if you're able to catch her tomorrow at nine o'clock. All right. God bless. And we'll see you hopefully on Sunday, either at our outdoor service or right where you are through live stream. God bless.